Welcome back to DWeb Decoded, your guide to navigating the decentralized web. Today I'm joined by Evin Chakasman, who is the director of the Blockchain Law for Social Goods Center at the University of San Francisco. In this episode, we discuss Evin's prior work helping to launch the World Economic Forum's Crypto Impact and Sustainability Accelerator and her current work promoting responsible and socially beneficial adoption of blockchain technology. We also preview a special upcoming event that she's producing in partnership with Filecoin Foundation for the Decentralized Web. Naveen, it's so great to have you on the show. Yeah, thank you so much for having me, Aaron. Amazing. Well, to get started, why don't you just give us a quick introduction? Uh, who are you personally and how did you find your way into the world of blockchain? Yeah, totally. So um, as you mentioned, uh, I'm the director of the Blockchain Law for Social Good Center, joined back in March. Uh, prior to that, I founded and led the World Economic Forum's Crypto Sustainability Coalition, where I drove thought leadership, content strategy, all of the things in between. Uh, during my time there, I established a lot of different initiatives, whether it be around our Crypto Impact and Sustainability Accelerator, which has since sunsetted, or around Pathways to Digital Justice, which the latter of which um, I explored data privacy issues related to intimate image abuses and restorative justice for victims of those abuses, which of course, unfortunately, is still very much propounded and relevant in our day and age, um, given AI's resurgence, for lack of a better word. Um, now, my background is not in blockchain or financial services, rather. It's is more so around foreign policy. I got my master's degree in public diplomacy at USC. I was in the pipeline to be a foreign service officer. I was working at Homeland Security Investigations. I mean, that was very much my world for the past, like for three or four years. And I had the opportunity to really be a part of the public sector and see that administration change from the Obama to the Trump administration, which was very interesting in you know, many different ways. But I did a lot of reflection once that had did come to pass to really see, you know, what I really wanted to focus my career on. You know, I wanted to kind of go back to the foundations of at that point, like my graduate studies and what I had set out to do as, you know, a potential FSO officer. And that was really around economic development and diplomatic affairs. I was, you know, really interested in, in engaging with communities of marginality, often left behind and sidelined from those you know, opportunities for financial inclusion and equity, those of which are often weaponized by people of privilege and, you know, autocratic orga organizations and governments, unfortunately. And that's what I really wanted to kind of focus my career on. So kind of trying to find my way back to that. I was like looking at a lot of different opportunities, came across the World Economic Forum, knew about the organization. They had an opportunity in data policy, didn't know anything about that. I was like, okay, totally down to understand and learn and kind of bridge that nexus with some of my expertise and interests. And I did that, hit the ground running. And now I'm here today talking to you, hopefully about all of the things that have to do with blockchain technology, financial equity, communities, all of the things that in many ways bring us to this really special space in the first place. Yeah. And it, I, I like your background because, I mean, everyone has like a super interesting sort of unique pathway into the world of, yeah. of blockchain and crypto, I guess. I mean, this is more of a blockchain conversation than a crypto conversation, I suppose. But everyone has kind of their own uh, unique, distinct pathway in. Right. And it's it's never something mm -hmm. that it's never there's no like off the shelf. Oh, I guess, you know, I just went to college for this and that's how I ended up here kind of thing. It's, it's always some there's always a few curveballs and a few different detours, et cetera. Um, totally. And, um, and you entered into the World Economic Forum at uh, a very interesting time, I think, because that's when the, the forum was really starting to maybe, you know, take these issues a little bit more seriously. I mean, not that they weren't taking them seriously before, but there's a bit more kind of emphasis on some of these and on, you know, obviously like with like Sheila Warren, who was really leading a lot of the blockchain efforts. And, and I think even with just out of the, the San Francisco office that they had, that opened uh, relatively recently, there was a lot more focus on emerging technologies and data policy and 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 all these kinds of things. So you entered at like a really uh, must have been kind of like a fun and interesting time where where there's some energy around these these topics that that there might not have been previously. Um, and I'd be interested in just to hear a bit more about your experience with the the crypto impact sustainability accelerator. 
uh, with the WEF. And, and in part, just because I've, I've, I've know a few of the people who have been involved in this and I've been kind of following the project over the years. And uh, I used to actually work for Michael Casey at Coindesk back when he was helping to kind of incubate this. So I wasn't really directly involved, but I at least knew about the project and I knew he was putting a lot of effort into it. So um, it'd be cool to just kind of get, you know, kind of a brain dump for you from you on, you know, what was, what was sort of the, the, you know, what did you accomplish here? What was rewarding about this project? Like, how did you guys, uh, you know, kind of move the ball down the field, so to speak? Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, you mentioned two really big names there, people that I really admire and love, Michael Casey of Coindesk and Sheila Warren at the Crypto Council for Innovation. I mean, Sheila, she was my supervisor on the data policy platform. And once I had sunsetted my work there, she came to me and was like, hey, I have this really, you know, exciting project around, you know, crypto and social impact and all of those things. And do you want to be a part of it? And, you know, you don't say no to Sheila Warren. <laughs> so uh, I, yeah, you know, got on that wagon. Wise, and wise life advice, right? <laughs> honestly, yeah, she's amazing. And she's obviously such an incredible person in this space to be following. But um, I jumped on that bandwagon. I'm glad I did because it was and is still such an interesting space. And, you know, during those two years that I was working on that project, um, I was able to learn a lot more than just, you know, the financial equity piece that is, of course, that golden use case that we use in this space, obviously. But I also got to explore, you know, issues around sustainability, uh, carbon markets, issues around Web3 applications, you know, uh, topics related to DAOs and governance, topics related to multi-generational wealth building. I mean, we had three pillars that substantiated this initiative and all of them worked towards the school to really investigate some of the implications and opportunities that we're seeing as this technology and this space evolves. Now, this project was very challenging in that, you know, most things in technology are that way. There are so many different nuances that we don't really take into account looking from the outside in. The World Economic Forum is a really, you know, powerful organization. It has, you know, a stance and a... Uh, uh, research agenda and a lot of different emerging technology topics, whether it be robotics, VR, data policy, what have you. And this was a very new space for the World Economic Forum. Of course, Sheila Warren, um, she founded and headed up the blockchain platform once the c ir Center based out in the Presidio of San Francisco, California had started. But crypto is new. It was new. It is still new to the WEF or the forum rather. So um, it was a little challenging to be able to move certain topics and outputs to the forefront. Uh, and, you know, at some point, once he who shall not be named FTX situation <laughs> um, had ensued, a lot of the other projects or outputs rather that we had in the pipeline that weren't your typical white paper had to be put on standstill. Um, so, you know, we were dealing with challenges that a lot of other platforms at the organization weren't really having to grapple with. Uh, and it was very, a unique situation, not only for us as a team and a platform, but also for, you know, the partners and the amazing stakeholders that we had managed to bring on to this project, which had amounted to almost 300 different folks. You put that into perspective and you're like, wow, there's that many people like <laughs> working in this at the same time, all of these things. So all of that is to say that there were their challenges, but I think that the payoff in the end was really amazing because now, although it has sunsetted, uh, there is still so much amazing work that's being pushed forward across the financial services and monetary platform based out in New York for the WEF that are looking at some of these issues, but from more of a financial services and governance perspective not to be overlooked, but still just as important. And I'm, you know, excited to still be a part of those conversations and see where that goes into the future. Yeah. I, I mean, I think it's, it's important to remember sometimes that, uh, you know, in this age of like instant gratification and Instagram and everything's instantaneous all the time, but like a lot of these issues, uh, I mean, a lot of these things that really are like a relay race, right. Where it's like, you're, you kind of have to just pass the baton off to the next, you know, the next racer, right. Or the, the next, the next person on your team who's, you know, taking the neck, I don't know what the technical name for that would be, but like, it was kind of like, a, it's like a relay race. Like, okay, I'm, my shift's over. I'm handing off the baton. It's like, you guys take it from here. Right. 
And uh, a lot of this is really, you're, you know, you're, 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 you're getting stakeholders to gel around a topic that is, you know, maybe, maybe, you know, viewed as controversial in, in some circles and you're trying to generate some, some common ground and some, some narratives and some, and just sort of general buy-in around this. And, and obviously in an organization like World Economic Forum, it's kind of its own, um, it's kind of like its own sort of, uh, you know, sausage making political apparatus of like how things get prioritized and whatnot. So, um, be, just being able to even get, I think as far as you did is like a huge victory, right? Just, just getting these types of issues on the forefront, uh, amid, you know, everything else that, that the forum focuses on, which is like a, a myriad of, of, you know, basically like every topic of importance to the world, I guess. Right. Mm-hmm. So, so that's super interesting. And it's really interesting to hear kind of some of the color behind all that came together and, and, and what you guys were able to accomplish there. So uh, thank you for that. Uh, maybe let's transition over to what you're doing currently with uh, with the center at the University of San Francisco. And looks like you guys have, you know, you've really been able to build up like a nice repertoire of of different projects and different partners. I know Filecoin Foundation is, uh, is supporting you guys and some things which we can talk about in a little bit, but maybe we'd love to get uh, just a bit of a brain dump on uh, what is it that you're working on now and what's, what's, uh, what's, what's, what should we, what should we be paying attention to here? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, the center was founded in February of last year, so it's still relatively new and it's, man, it's gone through so many different iterations and transformations, but all for good reason. As you mentioned, it's located at the university of San Francisco school of law. And our core mission is essentially to leverage the full potential of emerging technologies for the benefit of people and society. Now, we do this by, you know, several different ways, right? So we do this by designing and implementing research outputs and practical projects in collaboration with key stakeholders across the tech ecosystem, as well as the public and private sectors. Now, full emphasis on the public sector, because we do work very closely with, um, policymakers and government officials at the local, state, and federal levels around blockchain, education, and as of recently, that convergence between blockchain and AI specifically. Um, At the center, we strongly believe that through our work, we really need to push education forward. I mean, we are at a law school after all. Um, And we believe that because in order to have this next generation of leaders, judges, lawyers, change makers, what have you, um, in order for those folks to navigate this changing tech ecosystem responsibly with an equity mindset and oriented towards responsibility and conscious of the impact they may or may not be having on communities as close or disparate to their realities, we need to equip those folks with real education, real information, and all of which should be unbiased and, of course, balanced. So we really try to drive that through, of course, the education we provide at the school, as well as the training and education we provide to our stakeholders and public sector partners. Now, I will say that our mission has since evolved since our founding, right? Um, there, you know, The blockchain space has been and continues to be in many ways amorphous. And with other parallel technologies, we're seeing so many different exciting convergences Given this, we have been expanding our mandate to better encapsulate, you know, the gravitas of these exciting convergences and really demonstrate in all of these different ways how their responsible design and deployment can best serve people and society. So, yes, doing the research, yes, doing the education, but not stopping there, figuring out ways in which we can operationalize that and show how that can be demonstrated through real impact and real projects with hopefully scalable outcomes. So that's really where we're headed right now. And it's, I can talk a little bit more about some of the projects we're going to be introducing to our network in the coming year. Okay. Yeah. Great. Um, I guess like one follow up question on, um, on just kind of like the public sector stakeholder front. Right. Um, Mm -hmm. And obviously there's like, you know, there's, there's, there, there has been and will continue to be a huge need for education on this front. Um, but also we're at a time, uh, I guess, politically where like there's just a lot of, you know, I think there's just a lot of like uncertainty within the kind of the blockchain crypto industry about like, you know, politicians. There's a certain camp of politicians that really like us and there's a certain camp of politicians that really do not like us. Right. And there's a lot of 
you know, blockchain lobbyists and associations and, and, you know, people running around Washington, DC and state houses advocating for their various things, uh, whether, mm -hmm. you know, whether it's sort of on behalf of the broader industry or whether it's on, uh, you know, Bitcoin mining policies or whatever it might be. Uh, and I guess I'd just be interested in, and this is, this is sort of like the former, like, political journalist in me coming out, I guess, but I'm just kind of interested in like, how does, how do you see like your, a voice like yours, uh, or even a voice of, of just kind of the broader sector you represent, uh, where you're not necessarily like in this, like, you're not like lobbying on behalf of a commercial interest, but you're just really mm -hmm. more focused on, uh, we're trying to provide education. We're trying to provide, we're trying to just make sure that, that people who other wouldn't otherwise have a voice in this discussion are being represented. But how do how would you kind of describe, how you fit into this sort of, uh, you know, pie chart of like blockchain uh, advocacy when it comes to uh, trying to basically get the attention of the public sector and make sure uh, the relevant messages are being communicated. Absolutely. And I'm glad you asked that question because at the end of the day, no one cares about the technology. <laughs> at the end of the day, no one in the public sector really wants to know and go that deep right? They really are more interested in how is this going to impact my constituency? How is this going to fit into the discussions and conversations that I will ultimately have in an upcoming election, right? I mean, when I, the role that I see myself playing in this space is, of course, the educational part, but also in sort of pulling folks that I engage with in the public sector and, you know, regardless of any sector, out of their privileged developed mindset, right? I think that we navigate this world and we understand certain societal issues through the privilege that we have. And if we sort of step out of that and look at the statistics and really sort of engage in a thought exercise that pushes us to think, well, what if we didn't have some of the rights that we take advantage of every day. What if we didn't have a, you know, a relatively stable economic system? All of the what ifs. And that's really how I lead a lot of these conversations and how I am able to continue having those conversations where they don't hopefully get tired of me and they don't hopefully get tired of wanting to engage in this space because there is so much opportunity. And, you know, we mentioned earlier financial equity and inclusion. I think that's such an important use case. And I try to bring that really to the localities. So, you know, we understand and we know that 1.4 billion people lack access to banking services around the world at a global scale, right? And that, you know, that's 24% of the global adult population, but we only care when that's actually visceral in our backyard. So if we take that down to the localities, you know, according to the Fed, there was a study that showed, okay, 81% of adults are fully banked in the United States. And you think about it, and you're just like, wow, that isn't such a bad number. That's actually pretty good. And the fact that only 13% in the country are underbanked and 6% are unbanked, you're like, wow, okay, we're doing pretty good, right? No, we're not. Because that percentage of 81% continues to increase while the percentage of underbanked and unbanked steadily decreases. That's mm. a problem. That's a big problem. And it's more visceral if you are part of that. 13% that continues to decrease. And if you delve deeper, you see, unsurprisingly, that percentage is quite, you know, stark within historically marginalized ethnicities and races like Hispanics and Blacks. That's the reality. And, you know, doing research at the World Economic Forum, we looked at some of those statistics and tried to understand the nuances around how these different communities that are part of the 13% think about their generational wealth, how they think about their role in society and how that actually pulls into what they or how they see, you know, their municipal leaders and how they see our democratic systems. Now, all of that is such a ripple effect. And I feel like that's a really important conversation to be had. Of course, we throw around the 1.4 billion underbanked number a lot of the times. But I think it's important to be able to kind of dig a little deeper and make that connection with different constituencies that are really important to some of these um, public sector officials and leaders that we're talking to. And I'll just close with saying that, you know, 
this is something that I feel personally passionate about and is the reason why I'm even in this space to begin with. Because at the end of the day, I think it's important to be able to give space to people that are often feel like they don't have that they don't have a role in some of these decision-making processes that at the end of the day are going to impact them the most. And if we kind of lay that out and lay out some of the implications and some of the ways that we can fill that gap with innovations like blockchain, not being the silver bullet, but maybe, you know, getting us a little closer to a solution. I think that's a really great way to demonstrate some of the potential there and, you know, at a practical level for some of these, um, you know, policymakers and folks that will ultimately have such a big role to play and what the future architecture of this technology looks like. Yeah, it's really well stated. Uh, thank you for that. And I was just, as you were mentioning that, I was just kind of thinking back actually to uh, back when I was I was doing more just reporting uh, on crypto back in kind of the earlier days. And, you know, it, it, it always, I, I, growing up, like I never had any issue, you know, accessing financial services and, you know, whenever people would kind of run around with these narratives, like, oh, we're trying to bring you know, banking services, the other bank, it, it just never really resonated with me. Cause it's like, well, I've never like known anybody who didn't, couldn't get a bank account. I've never like, w- like experienced this firsthand. So it's kind of like one of these things where like, you don't really notice that it's a problem until you don't have it. And you're like, oh, like, okay. Like my checking account just got blocked because, you know, someone's fraudulently using my debit card. Now my bank account's blocked. Now I don't have any money for the next two days. You know, that's, it's like, yeah. okay, I see why this might be a problem. Right. So, <laughs> and, and it's, it's one of these um, things where I, 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 I think sometimes, you know, in our in the world of kind of crypto and blockchain, we like to, we we kind of pontificate on, pontificate on these things um, without necessarily like understanding like what are the actual problems that are being faced, right? And and I'll just leave I'll just say like one example quick, and then we can move on to the next question. But I found it kind of relevant. Like I, I went, I think it was that like Money Twenty Twenty a couple of years ago, maybe Twenty Twenty or Twenty Nineteen or something. And this was like this was you know you know in crypto, I was like okay, been to tons of conferences where people talk about financial inclusion, whatever. It's not that notable mm-hmm. necessarily, but like with this panel, it was just. The, the, the panel was just, they just grabbed some like local people from like Las Vegas who had, who were like underbanked, you know, quote unquote, like underbanked mm-hmm. people. And they're like, Hey, let's just like talk to you about like, what are the problems that you experience on a day basis? You know, what's the profile of these people? And it was just like very like moving to me. Cause I was like, wow, like these, none of these people, if, if I hadn't have actually heard their story, I would have never assumed that these people like couldn't get access to financial services. You know, like mm-hmm. it was like, like one lady yeah. was, you know, she was like 55. She looked like a normal person. She, but she was divorced. So she couldn't get credit and like all this kind of, her credit was ruined, all that kind of stuff. So it's like, even in the U S in a, in a, you know, a, a developed economy, right. Where, which is, which is we're very wealthy in advance. Like there's still a lot of these people that just kind of get like, you know, swept, like they just kind of, like they kind of fall through the cracks, I guess, is maybe the, the analogy mm-hmm. I'm looking for here. And there's a lot of different ways that, you know, these new technologies can, can, can factor into solving some of these problems. So anyway, so out of that, like, I would love to, to learn a bit more about like, what are some of the, the, the practical things that you guys are actually doing and what are some of the projects you're, you're working on or that you're, you're seeding and um, yeah, let's, let's dive in. Yeah, totally. So um, we there are a number of things, but as I said earlier, we are in many ways project based. So we try to liaise with a um, stakeholder partner within our network who's you know doing work obviously relevant and complementary to our own priorities around community and research and operationalization and pull that forward. And one of them, which is really exciting, which We'll be announcing a little bit more formally next year, but I can still talk about some of the details is around blockchain microbonds. I think it's really interesting, and I think it's something that is going to stir a lot more conversation at the local level in, you know, convergence with some of the impacts that blockchain can have at that, you know, at that nexus. So, um, you know, our team is going to be uh, pretty much researching, designing, and implementing a community microbond built on a blockchain. Um, I, I don't want to reveal the detail there yet, but um, we are going to be building on um, one of the uh, industry's uh, blockchains. Uh, for the purposes of bridging the gap between projects that seek to address the needs of underbanked communities and actually being able to finance those needs. So a little background, and I'm so sorry if you already know all the things about microbonds. This is still a space that I found really interesting and I was, you know, continuing to research a little bit about it. Oh, please tell us. Okay, sweet. (laughs) As So um, traditional municipal bonds are 
super expensive. They're hard to access. They are generally targeted towards wealthier individuals, people who can, you know, afford the most expensive bonds. And this new microbond system that we want to build on a blockchain would essentially address these challenges, not solve these challenges, of course, but, you know, get us a little closer to a better outcome. And, you know, by allowing municipal bonds to be purchased for a hundred bucks or less, that's really the ideal there, as opposed to the five grand purchasing minimum for traditional municipal bonds. That's a, that's a big, a big deal for people yeah. who are ultimately not even able to be a part of that at all. Now, by utilizing a blockchain, um, access to municipal bonds is pretty much open to all communities who, first of all, are equipped and educated and set up for success to be a part of that process, right? Not just the ones who can afford them and understand it up from the get-go. Um, and there is a level of inclusiveness. There's a level of education. And there is also a huge level of transparency that makes it possible for mostly underserved, underbanked, and unbanked communities to be able to participate, learn, and be a part of this important decision-making process that has a huge impact on you know, their neighborhoods and whatnot. So in that sense, blockchain really offers this really transformative solution, at least in my eyes and a lot of the different um, folks that we'll be working with. But a really cool and interesting case study for this that has sort of inspired this, you know, movement towards in this direction is really the city of Berkeley. I don't know if you know this or not, but like the city of Berkeley, they uh, were the first to start a blockchain microbond project, hmm. which, oh, no. which is so that. interesting. It's like right here, right? Um, I'm, I'm based in San Francisco, so I'm like, it's right here. <laughs> um, <laughs> one of our advisory board members, uh, Ben Bartlett, he's the vice mayor of Berkeley, and he actually led this whole venture. And the whole purpose here was pretty much to allow community members in Berkeley to invest directly into public projects they care the most about, like mm -hmm. investing in more green spaces, investing in city infrastructure, more effective emergency healthcare services, all of the things that, you know, are only as propounded if it is impacting our neighborhoods the most, do we care, right? Um, and unfortunately, in neighborhoods in the city of Berkeley or elsewhere, some of those services aren't even available. So this plan would ultimately be able to kind of bridge that gap, like I iterated earlier, around public projects that need that investment and people who are mostly impacted by those projects not being complete. So how can we bridge mm. that gap with the blockchain enables microbond that's cheaper, more accessible, and just easier for people to participate what are you tackling there? Greater civic engagement. You're tackling, you know, the information gap and innovation where people that, you know, have more opportunities to greater education and finances are able to be taking part, whereas everyone else doesn't even know what's happening and that's not fair, right? Um, so this is something that we've been discussing for the past few months and it's something that we have been also discussing with a few U.S. jurisdictions as well to see um, which ones want to pilot this project with us. We've made some headway in a few jurisdictions, including uh, Wyoming and Colorado, which is really interesting. They've shown some curiosity in piloting a project like this for their own jurisdictions. Also, the city of Bakersfield has expressed hmm. interest as well. Um, so all of this is to say that, you know, I'm happy to share more details once we kick this off and to show some of the progress. We're going to open source a lot of the different progress that we make at each milestone so that people feel like they're, you know, a part of the process. But I personally think that once this gains traction and we're able to lock in a U.S. jurisdiction and we actually demonstrate the ways in which we can bridge the participatory and informational gap between local communities that are underserved and underbanked and city officials and public projects, a lot of other US jurisdictions are gonna want to take part in it. And that's really the hope. So um, this I think is just a really great use case also for some of the uh, local and state uh, policymakers that we work with um, to just kind of show them like, hey, this is like a really great opportunity, A, to be a part of it and B, to 
understand and see how this technology is being pushed into action. We're not just going to be doing the research, but actually building a tool, building a platform and working with real communities to actually put this to the test, right? And I think that's actually just such a great, at least approach that we're taking at the center. And we have another project which details, unfortunately I can't disclose at the moment, that will kind of piggyback a little bit more on that operational piece. So, um, yeah, all of that's really exciting. <laughs> no, that's super cool. And, and, you know, I, I really find the, the more, the more I'm kind of diving into learning about the whole kind of real world asset, uh, tokenization bandwagon movement, uh, I guess, whatever you want to call it, but it really just does seem so obvious that, you know, the future of, of all like, public debt markets like this are going to be tokenized, right? And it, it is a very obvious use case, I think, from, you know, starting at like, you know, a national kind of sovereign debt issuance perspective, um, where I could, you know, tokenize, like the US could issue a tokenized, you know, fractional, you know, tokenized public bond, and it's like fractionalized, and you can like trade that on like Uniswap or something, or, you know, something like that, or all the way down to something what you're talking about, which is, uh, it's like, hey, we're, we're, we're trying to raise uh, fifty thousand dollars so that we can build a uh, a local like swimming pool in the neighborhood or something or like mm-hmm. a library or, or you know something like very localized right that's like has a very mm-hmm. clear benefit to a small subset of people that like live in that neighborhood and like those people could invest in it directly uh you know the barrier to actually issuing the the debt would be would be significantly lower presumably uh but then also mm-hmm. the the barrier to investing in these types of uh projects are also you know, would be, would be significantly lower as well. Um, so it's a super interesting, uh, use case. So I'm really excited to see kind of how that, how that pans out. So, uh, yeah. please do keep us apprised, uh, on that front as, as more information comes available. Um, and then I want to turn here, uh, to another, of, uh, topic, I guess that's coming up. We've got, we've got an event, uh, that the Filecoin foundation is going to be, uh, partnering with, with, you all to support in February, I believe it is. And mm-hmm. that's really going to be highlighting, you know, some of these projects that you're working on and also some new things and some other partners and things like that. So uh, would love to just get the download from you on uh, what is this event all about and why should we be excited about it? Totally. Um, yeah. So we, as you said, are partnering with Filecoin Foundation for the Decentralized Web. It's been really great to work with the team over there. They've been so awesome and helping to kind of grapple across all of these different topics and speakers and details and all of the things events, right? (laughs) Um, But it will be taking place on Tuesday, the 27th of February, uh, and it'll be opening registration Uh, once we get back from the Thanksgiving break. So of course, I'll share details with you and the team and we can share it out with the greater network. But the objective here really is to explore how decentralized and emerging technologies such as blockchain, artificial intelligence, distributed community networks can really be leveraged for social good across a variety of different industries and use cases of which, of course, we've mentioned earlier in this conversation. We'll be joined by some really amazing experts um, as well from across law, policy, tech, human rights, what have you, including the Crypto Council for Innovation. So we'll have uh, the CEO, Sheila Warren, in doing some uh, speaking for us across the program. We'll have some colleagues from Coindesk. We'll have uh, some colleagues from TechSoup. We'll have uh, uh, Ben Bartlett, the vice city mayor of Berkeley, coming in to um, talk on one of our panels. We'll have one of our international affiliated scholars from the Africa Blockchain Institute, who has been doing research and has been part of our fellowship program. He, in conjunction with two other scholars, will be sharing some of the research that they've been doing across ESG, blockchain, uh, racial equity and inclusion, policy, all of the things. They will be sharing their insights during that convening as well. And, you know, really our hope for this event is to demonstrate just how powerful uh, blockchain can be in cohesion with other technologies and systems, irrespective of the sensationalism we see and hear in the headlines that in many ways is just mis- and disinformation. Um, and we want to do that really to kind of showcase how this is being supportive of people, communities, and of course, our diverse climate ecosystems. We want to make sure that that third part is part of those um, discussions as well. 
Um, and, you know, there are a number of exciting use cases that are emerging at the nexus of these technologies. And we're really looking forward to bridging the gap between some of these multi-stakeholder groups that don't necessarily work together, but talk about each other in these projects to kind of bring them together to, you know, coalesce across different thought exercises and breakouts and panels and whatnot. So it's going to be a really great opportunity to see how these different technologies and industries are coalescing and just, you know, how can we talk a little bit more uh, future forward about the potential for some of these things to be helpful um, force multipliers for good as, as opposed to uh, arbiters for bad, right? So um, not creating more blind spots along the way, but talking about it and figuring out a way forward that is positive and optimistic about what we can do there. So registration will open um, end of November, early December, and it will be both in person and virtual. So we'll be able to make sure it's as inclusive as possible for folks everywhere. Amazing. So that sounds like it's gonna be an awesome event. We're looking forward to that. Definitely would encourage folks to check that out. Uh, coming come in February, uh, and when the registration page opens, we'll be we'll be announcing that on our channels. So keep an eye out for that. Um, and uh, with that, I'd like to just wrap up here with Avin. Uh, Avin, any final thoughts from you on anything we've discussed here today, or and how can folks uh, get in touch with you or learn more about the work you're doing? Absolutely. So um, first of all, thank you so much for such a enriched discussion and amazing uh, opportunity here to talk a little bit more about our work and you know some of the issues that we both care about related to the space. I think this is a really great channel for that. Um, in terms of things to look forward to, aside from our social impact summit, I know I mentioned earlier, we have two projects that are forthcoming that we'll be officially announcing. Um, you know, as the next year kicks off, if you want to be a part of that, see where the progress goes, um, you can feel free to follow me on Twitter, still not on board with calling it X, and LinkedIn, you can do the same with our center as well for any announcements and whatnot. And thanks again. Amazing. Well, thanks so much, Avine, for your time here. And thanks everyone for listening. And we will be back soon with another great episode.